Hello, my quilting friends. I'm Leah Day, a professional quilter, author, and online teacher. And this podcast is all about quilting, running a creative business, and balancing our busy hands with our busy lives. You can find the episode show notes and links to everything mentioned in this podcast at leahday.com. Enjoy the show. Hello, my quilting friends. This is Leah Day with episode 15 of the podcast, and I'm recording this on March 2nd, 2017, and today I have an excellent interview with Julie Persinger. Julie is a long-arm quilter, and we're going to talk a lot about running a long-arm business and what that's like, uh, how Julie got started making quilts, and uh, kind of what inspired her to get started after, uh, you know, I would really say a family tragedy. So um, it's a really good episode, and I loved meeting Julie and getting to know her. I feel like I've made a new quilting friend, so that feels excellent, too. Now for a few updates around the house, we have... So many things that have gone on since last week, uh, or I should say two weeks ago. Um, It's just been a really, really busy two weeks, and I've been making lots of progress in lots of different things, and I'd like to share them with you. So the first thing is I am working on two goddess quilt patterns, and this is for Island Batik. Uh, They have a new uh, Batik Foundations program working with their, what's called their Foundations um, line, which is all of their basics and blenders that are in stock all the time. So you can generally find them either in quilt stores uh, or uh, online pretty much all the time. And they don't go out of stock. And I love that. I have a real hard time designing quilts with fabric that's like uh, it's here and then it's gone. You know, that feels very uh, short term to me. And you never know when, you know, somebody might come by and see the quilt and be like, you know, five years later, say, hey, I really want to make that. Uh, and I think it's really important to design with fabric that's going to be around forever so that you can always make exactly that quilt if you want to. So that's why this this program is working really, really well for me. And I love working with Island Batik. They just have such amazing, awesome Batik fabrics. And so the two goddesses that I'm working on, uh, one is an, an older design that I've kind of Um, brought back and tweaked and played with and fiddled with and uh, it's called a peaceful goddess quilt and it's going to be quilt as you go and uh, the other one is a brand new design uh, called eternal love and it's um, kind of a madonna and child so both of these are really fun and I'm kind of having to force myself to figure out the design and to simplify it and to finally develop a single method of applique that I like that I want to teach. And this is not a small deal. Um, When I make the goddess quilts, usually I will mix and match lots of different techniques. So I'll do some of it, you know, with piece lique, which is kind of a combination of applique and piecing. Uh, Great for curved edges, but it is very time consuming and it's very tedious and it takes a lot to explain it. I also do a little bit of turned edge. Sometimes I'll fuse certain pieces. You know, if something's tiny and fiddly, it's like, ah, I'm going to just fuse that down, you know. Um, And so I I mix it up quite a lot. And I don't really want to do that for these quilt patterns because, number one, that's just plain confusing. Uh, and And I really want to keep these simple and make them really fun, you know, really fun to create. Uh, So that's kind of launched me on this whole process of figuring out which applique method I want to go with and which applique method I want to teach and focus on from now on. And I do think it's important to pick one method and kind of go with it. I've been looking at other applique teachers and just kind of looking at their businesses and how they teach applique and all of them pretty much universally pick one method and stick with it and don't deviate from that method. And I think the reason is applique is so vast and so huge and there's so many different ways to do it that unless you focus on one method, you end up with a really confusing mess. Um, So yesterday I was working on the Peaceful Goddess and and I think that's going to be the easier of the two patterns simply because it's um, less pieces in its quilt as you go. So you do one block at a time. And so I cut out the pieces, or Dad helped me prep up half of it. He did the, he did the hard job <laughs> of uh, preparing the freezer paper templates 
and uh, cutting everything out and getting half of it ready. And then I sat down with fabrics and started playing. And within about 30 minutes, I was like, okay, I'm not sure turned edge applique is really all that. I mean, that was, that has been my favorite for years, but some pieces are just so fiddly and so tiny. And in all honesty, uh, I know I don't have time to hand applique it. I don't have time to sit there and hand stitch it. And there's always that piece of my mind that is like, okay, if I'm going to bother to turn an edge, I want to get credit for it, which means I'm going to hand applique it. That's the whole point of a turned edge. To me, this is just my opinion, if I sit there and turn an edge and then I machine stitch over it, what is the point? You know, I've just defeated the whole point of turning the edge, <laughs> you know, that nice, completely seamless finish, you know, I, I've completely ruined it. So uh, I thought about that a lot. I spent about three hours just doing half of one block uh, and, and working on it and, and kind of thinking through the process and ultimately decided, okay, so I've done this one. Let's, let's try this again with fusible web. So uh, today, Dad has been tracing and cutting out fusible web pieces for me, and I'm going to probably go down this afternoon and start fusing some stuff together and just see how that goes together. Um, the nice thing is, is that the master pattern works great for either one. So, you know, the same pieces that you overlap and, and cut longer for turned edge applique are going to be the exact same pieces that you overlap and cut longer for fusible applique. So you know, the same master pattern can be used for multiple types of applique. It's just, you know, the, the situation changes with, you know, whether you're preparing fusible web or you're preparing freezer paper templates. And uh, if I sound like I'm agonizing about this, it is, you know, that is exactly what I'm doing. I am agonizing about this. And for the last three days, uh, I have been focusing so much attention on it because I really want to get it right. And I have... I have never been able to do this without it becoming so complicated and so tedious and so overwhelming that I've set it aside. So um, if you remember back, if you were an unfortunate member of the 2013 <laughs> Quilts Along, and I say unfortunate because that was just such a mess, I did a quilt, I did a goddess quilt for 2013. It was, she's called Express Your Love. And because I could not pick one method, I ended up making like six different quilts and I made them all at the same time. So like for maybe two weeks, you would get, uh, here's how to do this type of applique or here's how to do this quilting design. And then the next week I'd be starting a totally new quilt. I mean, it was, it's, it was a mess. And I, you know, I have, I have since greatly improved my ability to do quilt alongs. That was my lesson in how not to do it. And, uh, and I think that that has, it's, because I've always made it a mess, I've been intimidated uh, on how to fix it and get it right and been a little stuck on, on that. So I'm processing through it. I'm working forward and I'm going to figure it out. And we are going to have two goddess quilt patterns ready for this fall. And, and it's nice to be working with a company that sets deadlines because I have to have them done by June uh, to ship them for the catalog shoot. So that's good for me. That's what I need. Uh, I need someone to tell me when something must be done. Otherwise, I will fiddle with it and fiddle with it forever and never get it finished. Uh, so I feel like this is moving in the right direction. It's definitely aligning with my goals and, and where I want to be moving and what I want to be sharing. Uh, but it's not easy. Uh, these goddess quilts are very close to my heart, too. I think that kind of makes them harder because I want to put so much more into them. And I want them to be perfect, absolutely perfect. Uh, and I have to kind of just take it down a notch and, and accept uh, where they are, you know, when, when they're ready. And, and that's going to be fine. So that's exciting, just delving into this whole applique world and having fun with that. Um, I have been working on the Walking Foot book quite a lot too, just, you know, chipping away at it with my 15 minutes a day. Uh, the index card system I mentioned in the last podcast has definitely been working well. I took the index cards and my uh, computer keyboard with me on the trip. And uh, I was able to knock out, you know, 15 minute segments on the book throughout the trip. In fact, actually, I think I was better at getting on that on the trip than I am at home. Uh, so that was kind of interesting. So I just sat down 
Um, sometimes in the morning with James, I'd give him a book to read. We'd go and, and get some a cup of coffee or something while Josh slept in. And uh, I would work a little bit on the book and James would read his book and Josh would get to sleep in and everybody was happy. <laughs> yeah, so that worked out really well. And, and it, it's wonderful that it's organized now and I feel like it's moving forward. And after I get done, I think I'm nearly done with the second chapter and I'm really going to start budgeting my time to knock out the quilts because so I have uh, seven quilts for the book and uh, I think only two of them are complete at this point and they really need to be in a further state of completion uh, to be moving forward. So I mentioned the trip. I really want to tell you about this. Uh, we went to Quilt Con. We went down to Savannah. We also uh, went to Charleston, had James's birthday party. He turned 10, which I don't know why, but that makes me feel very old. <laughs> I'm only 33, but uh, having a 10-year-old little boy uh, makes me feel ancient. I know, I know that's, I, he was going to be 20 one day and then I'll feel like, I don't know. It just, it warps my brain a little bit. I can still remember when he's itsy bitsy and it just feels like this has gone so fast. Uh, and we had a wonderful time. Uh, I have to say quilt con was such an amazing experience and, uh, and I can see, I can, I can understand what it's all about now. You know, I've never been to QuiltCon. I'm not a member of the Modern Quilt Guild. Um, I have, mm, I wouldn't say been critical of the modern movement, but I am, I am critical of, um, of, of needing to call yourself something special, okay? And, uh, you know, for many years, you know, before modern, it was all about being an art quilter. You know, a lot of people would, would try and apply that word to me. And I would say, no, I am just a quilter. I'm not an art quilter. I'm not a traditional quilter. I'm not a contemporary quilter. Now I'm not a modern quilter. I am a quilter because that definition, that, that term encompasses all of it. And I don't need an extra additional descriptive word, um, because that extra descriptive word could one day be a detriment, not a help that it could become a limiting force, you know, where, and this is, this is from my history with beadwork, um, where when I did beadwork, it was, it was very much like, oh, I, I do this type of beadwork and only with these types of beads and I only do it this way and everything else doesn't count. And I'm very careful having gone through that and having had that craft nearly destroyed uh, certainly my enjoyment with it was nearly destroyed because I wasn't allowed, I did not allow myself to innovate. I did not allow myself to try new things. I did not, I put myself in a box and I closed the lid and I said, this is what you do and that's it and nothing else counts. And it got really boring really quick and really frustrating really quick. So I never want to do that with quilting. I learned from that experience and I want to keep my world as open and big and, um, and, you know, just, just as wide open as I possibly can. And so I'm just a quilter. I'm not a modern quilter. I'm not an art quilter. I'm just a quilter, but I totally get the modern quilt movement now. And I really get quilt con now. Uh, it's an awesome show. And it has fantastic quilts that are very different and not just different in the, oh, that's a minimalist quilt. You know, that's a quilt with a big circle on it. You know, it's, it's less, it's less and more than that. <laughs> if this makes any sense at all, I don't know. Uh, but uh, I found many of the quilts um, overwhelmingly peaceful. And I, I don't know if that's a contradiction in terms, but um, they were very, simplistic in their piecing and very simplistic in their quilting uh, but somehow with that simplicity they were also complex and you know I think there's it takes a lot of guts to make a quilt that you know and try and compete with it that isn't a big overwhelming thing you know um, I was a competition quilter for years and I and I loved it uh, but it does kind of feel like you're pulling out the kitchen sink and then some, you know, when you're really competing to win, you need to make something different and unique. And and I see these quilts, you know, I was at Quilt Market and saw the quilts that were hung for festival. And it really does just start getting to be such a busy mess. I mean, I'm not trying to offend anybody here, but it really just can get 
to be too much. You know, intense applique with intense quilting and, you know, throw some Sforzky's crystals on it too. Why not? I think probably just butchered that word completely. Those like, you know, those hot fix crystals and stuff, you know, um, been there, done that. I look at that now and I'm kind of, I don't know, bored by it is probably the best, you know, best thing to describe. I mean, I was there and I shot very few fit pictures of quilts at Quilt Market. And then I was at QuiltCon and it was like I could not put my camera away. You know, I love the quilts there. They were so pretty and so peaceful and uh, really inspiring. Several of the quilts uh, made me stop and think and look at them closely. Um, several of the quilts had me like, oh my gosh, I've got to try that technique. Uh, one in particular, my favorite from the show is called Smoke. Uh, and it was created by the same quilter who won Best of Show. Uh, I don't think that Smoke, that particular quilt ended up ribboning. I can't remember. Um, but basically she created this really cool effect with the quilting stitches using different weights of thread. So she um, ranged, and I'm sorry, her name is Kathleen Jones, and she ranged the thread weight from five weight to 60 weight, and that created this totally unique effect on the thickness of the thread of the surface of the quilt, and I loved it. It was like, oh gosh, give me a machine. I've got to try that, you know? And I very rarely feel that when I go to, to most quilt shows. I very rarely feel inspired and I think that's what QuiltCon really does well. It's very inspiring. Uh, I love the vendors, too. The vendors were great. There were a lot of, you know, there were a lot of the same old, same old. Like, you know, great, thank you, more Moda pre-cuts, you know, seen that everywhere, and then some. Um, but then there were a lot of really different vendors, too. Um, there was a ceramicist there, and I'm trying to remember her name. Um, I can't remember off the top of my head. I will make sure to link it up on the blog, freemotionproject.com. I will make sure to link it up so that way you can go check out her Etsy shop. But she had these crazy ceramics that were like uh, different weird animals. So um, she had giraffes. I think they were giraffes. Um, horses, uh, unicorns, ducks, and all of them were pin cushions. So the, the ceramic was half of it. And then... The other half was a really cute pin cushion. Uh, so I got one. I got her last naked lady. <laughs> the, that was the other thing. She had a lot of faces too. And they were like, um, the ceramic was like half the person's face. And then uh, the top cut out and that was where the pin cushion kind of slipped down. And so I got a really funky one that was like, you know, a naked lady <laughs> with a, a strawberry pin cushion on the top. And I ended up buying two for my sisters as well. Uh, because growing up, we had this head, this ceramic, ugly head on our kitchen table, and it was always filled with loose change. And these reminded me of that, although they were super pretty. Uh, so I had to get one, you know, and I, I've never seen anything like that at a quilt show. And um, her booth was always packed. So I think that she was in the right place at the right time. Uh, I bought a lot of fabric. And I bought a lot of uh, hand quilting stuff, hand embroidery stuff, which was interesting. It's always fascinating when I go to a show what I end up with, you know, what catches my eye and what I can't live without. And French General set up a booth. And turns out I played with French General fabric just a little while ago. I made a um, double Irish chain for Quilty Box. They were doing, they did a Quilty Box one month and I saw their booth and this is one of those things I think some companies do so well is there it's I guess it's a combination of marketing and packaging where, you know, everything has a certain design aesthetic and it looks so good together. Everything combines in such a pretty package that you almost want you almost want to take it home just because it's so pretty. And that's exactly why I ended up buying a French general hoop and some French general fabric and some embroidery floss. I mean, I have all this stuff already. You know, I already have an embroidery hoop and I already have tons of floss, but I, I wanted that uh, particularly. And, and it's an awesome hoop. It's got kind of a, um, um, almost like a slinky, think uh, like a coiled, um, a coiled elastic chain. I can't, I'm not describing this very well, but think slinky is the thing that tightens around the hoop. So you don't have to sit there and twist and twist and twist. You just pop it on and pop it off. And I love that about it. Uh, so I just had such a great time at QuiltCon. I saw amazing quilts. I feel super inspired. 
uh, to play with uh, minimalist design, to play with minimalist quilting, and uh, and just play with designing a overwhelmingly peaceful quilt. You know, now that I've seen that and I know that feeling that they give, I, I want to challenge myself to make one of those. And I want to. I one thing I was thinking of as I was walking through the show is what would a minimalist goddess look like? You know, uh, and what would she represent? And I've been I've been thinking about that. And it's been kind of chugging away in the back of my brain. And I know I'll sit down with a paper and pencil and just kind of start sketching something out and just start playing with that idea. Um, because I think, I think that's been there percolating away for a while now. And, uh, I think QuiltCon was just the thing to really help bring it to the surface. So I would definitely say QuiltCon's the place to be. Certainly, uh, as a professional quilter, saw so many friends, saw so many people there. Uh, got to hang out with Krista Watson, one of my quilting BFFs, and uh, help her out with her class. That was excellent. You know, she needed to switch out from uh, free motion quilting feet to walking feet. And here's the thing that you might not know. When you walk into a class at a big show and there are 25 plus machines and they are all set up perfectly for you, threaded, they have the right foot installed, they are all on and they have the right settings preset. Someone had to do that. You know, it's not a magical fairy <laughs> that does that for, for the teacher. Uh, there, you know, and it took about a good solid hour uh, and it was me and Stephanie Palmer and Debbie Brown and even and Krista too. And all of us just, you know, picked a row of machines and started knocking them out. Uh, and it took a solid hour to get all of them switched over and make sure all of them had thread. Uh, and I loved being able to do that for my friend. You know, uh, I wanted to make sure she had a very, very successful class and it wasn't too stressful for her. And that her students had a wonderful time too. You know, that means a lot to me. Uh, making sure that everybody has a great experience. And I hope that you're able to see, you know, that that stuff, someone has to do it. It's not instantaneous and it's not always easy. So if you're ever at a show and something's not quite right, uh, please, I guess, kind of approach that in a very gentle way because most likely it is not the teacher that had any control over the room in any way. And uh, And sometimes you really have to book it from one class to another to get things ready and get things going. Um, so that was really fun. And I had a good time, you know, just kind of chilling out with the girls and switching feet and winding bobbins. And that was, that was a good time. Uh, and it was a good time seeing everyone there. Uh, so many people came up and, and uh, wanted to give me a hug. And that's great. I, I love going to shows, uh, but I rarely do. And the, the little bit that I do, I'm, I'm so glad to see everybody. And, um, and it, it does make me feel famous uh, in kind of a, a weird way. Um, but at the same time, I love being home and, and doing my work, you know. So I know that going to shows will never be a big thing for me. It's never going to be something I do more than once or twice a year. Um, but when I do go, it gives me that that needed boost, you know. I came home feeling really great about myself, and and that was a really good boost and made me feel good and invigorated. All of the things that you need from a show, basically. Um, and I know that the next, let's see here, next year I think it's going to be far away again. But I think in 2019 there's going to be a quilt con in Nashville, Tennessee. So that's definitely in my neck of the woods. I think I could get there. So I'm planning on attending QuiltCon for uh, 2019. Just I'll probably just attend and walk the show and enjoy myself the same way I did this time. That, that seems like the most fun to me. So let's see here. What else has been going on? Um, we have a new block for the Machine Quilting Block Party that just launched yesterday. And that is a patchwork tulip. Very, very cute. Lots of cool quilting. So we're going to do some swirling water, pebbling. Um, I combine designs in the vase. So there's a little bit of pebbling in the bottom and then some ruler foot quilting lines. And that kind of, uh, it was a challenge. I'll be honest. You know, I had to, I had to think things through, you know, like uh, I'm using the ruler for half of it. And then I had to, whenever I ended a line against the pebbling, I had to remember to, to push the ruler away and travel stitch along the pebbling. So it was a challenge and it was really fun. I love combining designs like this. Uh, so be looking for the video on piecing that patchwork tulip block that will be coming out on Monday. 
And let's see, what else is happening? Um, oh, speaking of flowers, I am working on a flower mask. So silly story. Um, when Hobby Lobby, a Hobby Lobby came in just down the road. I am, it's dangerously close. Like I can get to Hobby Lobby in four minutes flat. Uh, and I kind of live in the country, so that's saying something. <laughs> so it's really nice location where this Hobby Lobby is coming to Shelby. And um, when it first opened, we went there after dinner, and I was kind of horsing around being silly. And James took a picture of me um, <laughs> acting weird <laughs> with these big, massive flowers, because I saw these like gigantic massive flower stems and I was like oh my gosh I've got to hide underneath it I don't know what I was thinking but I was just goofing around so James snapped this silly picture of me and I have wanted to buy some of those big giant flowers and make a mask and make a, like a headdress with them uh, well I have I have the inspiration and then now I have um, the thing to give me a deadline and that is uh, a local art competition it's a wearable art competition uh, put on through the Arts Council in my town and so uh, I have now a deadline and I need to put this thing together so I have uh, bought myself a big giant <laughs> massive flower poppy and now I've got to figure out how to somehow attach that to a mask and build a mask out of it so I was just talking through the steps with dad and uh, you know dad's ultimate advice is multiple attachment points you always have to have multiple attachment points basically what that means is if you um, if you screw something heavy and you only use one screw uh, then it will probably swing around and it'll be loose and wobbly. But if you stick three screws into it and kind of in a triangle kind of location, so uh, two kind of side by side and then a third one a little further out, then that thing is not going anywhere. So I think I'm going to attach the flower to a bit of styrofoam and wood and then attach that bit of styrofoam and wood to the top of the mask and reinforce everything with tons of hot glue and layers of fabric and paper. Uh, I have found that hot glue plus paper plus plastic, something about that combination, it is rigid and perfect for masks. And so I'm super excited about that. I'll probably be spending most of the weekend knocking that out. I, I'm, I'm so excited about it. It just seems like such a fun thing. It's a little bit of a tangent. It's completely not quilting related. But I think that's good because, you know, as deeply as I've been working on this applique stuff, I need something light and fluffy that I can just hot glue and screw together. And, you know, when I'm not working on applique, because while I'm working on that mask, I will be thinking about applique in the back of my head and that, that somehow that will be processing it and working it through and, it, and it'll all work out. So I, I would definitely be sharing some photos of that uh, mask as it comes through. I also have a ice queen mask and I have um, about oh I guess a hundred icicles that I'm going to put together and make this I want to make a an, it's going to be another kind of headdress style mask and uh, I think that's going to come out really good I still need to figure out how to attach the icicles to the mask again I think I'll probably end up using a lot of paper a lot of hot glue um, but just thinking through that and kind of troubleshooting out how things attach is a challenge and it all of its own and it's wonderful so that's pretty much for the updates around the house. A lot going on. Loved the show. Loved the trip. I'm so happy to be home, though. This is, this is where I belong. And I'm getting further ahead with the block party, working on these applique goddesses. And it just really feels like everything's moving forward in a good way. It's all going to be going slowly because I have so many things going on. But it is all moving forward. And that's excellent. Now, the sponsor for the show is my website and the Machine Quilting Block Party. And we have three blocks for you to jump in on. You'll learn how to piece, how to applique, and how to machine quilt. So that should definitely entice you to get started. If you have been wanting to build new skills for machine quilting, this is the place to go. Uh, you'll learn so much. And the cool thing is it's quilt as you go. So you will piece the block uh, or applique the block and then quilt it. And then at the end, we will cut them all down and connect them together. And if you want to make the quilt bigger, it's a, it's a relatively small quilt. Uh, if you want to make the quilt bigger, we also have an optional sashing and cornerstones pattern that you can add that will make the quilt uh, 65 inches by 85 inches. 
So it's an awesome project. It's going to be a year-long quilt along. So we're only in the third month. It's, it's a great time to get started. So you can check that out at leahday.com slash block party. So now that we have got that mega gigantic introduction <laughs> through, uh, here is the episode with Julie Persinger about long arm quilting. Hello, my quilting friends. Leah Day here with Julie Persinger, a long arm quilter from Nashville, Tennessee. Welcome to the show, Julie. Thank you, Leah. It's so exciting to finally get to talk to you. Absolutely. So you're a long arm quilter. Uh, you do this professionally, you quilt quilts for other people, but why don't you kind of go back a bit and share a bit about yourself and how you got into quilting and, and kind of the story before it became a business for you? Okay, that'd be cool. Um, so I grew up with quilters around me. My grandmother was a quilter, hand quilter. Um, but what I always found kind of funny was that she did not really start quilting until late in her life. Um, we always kind of have this image of people of our grandmother's generation. Maybe that was something that they always did because, you know, back in the day, girls were taught handwork. And I'm sure she probably was. Um, she's since passed away, so I can't ask her all of that, which now, I've, of course, I really want to know. Um, but it wasn't until, to my knowledge, it wasn't until later in her life that she decided to take up quilting. And she had a group of friends that had their own quilting circle. And I mean, and it was it was an old school quilting circle. They met in the church basement. They had a quilt frame. They all hand quilted together and they did it for years until they all kind of aged out. <laughs> and so that was just normal to me to see people quilting. And um, the irony now is that when I started quilting, um, I got my first sewing machine right after I got married in 1998. And from the time I started, everything I did was hand quilted because that's all I knew. And in my mind, up until very recently, that was the only real quilting. I, it's like I was the quilting police in some ways. Um, you know, machine quilting, I always dismissed as, well, that's, you know, that's just cheating and it's lazy and that's, that's not the real thing. And of course, it's not until you actually try to machine quilt that you realize, oh, hey, there's actually some skill involved in this. And this is, it's not cheating. In fact, it's, it's just as much work, maybe faster work, but it's still a lot of work. So I, like I said, I started sewing, I guess, in about 98 and then hand quilted um, basic projects until about 2004. That's when I had two children by then. And as much as I loved it, it just takes so long to hand quilt a project. And, you know, and that was at a time when the big stitch quilting movement wasn't a thing. So it was, it was very traditional. Um, so I just simply didn't have time to do it as much as I enjoyed it. So I moved on to much more portable things like knitting and did that for a long time. Um, but it wasn't until about 2013, I think that I started to think maybe, maybe it's time. I had had my third and last child and she was three or four by then. And, you know, finally at an age where she could be entertained for a while by herself. And, um, but really what, what kind of triggered that return to quilting was that my son was diagnosed with type one diabetes when he was six years old. And at the time, um, we went to Vanderbilt here in Nashville for a day of very intensive training for me to learn everything that I needed to know to learn how to take care of him. And kind of by accident, it, it wasn't really a planned thing, but they, they had a fleece blanket. Um, he was, he was not well, he, he wasn't sick enough to be hospitalized, but he was, he was headed that way. And so they found a blanket that they had left over from a scavenger hunt and made a little bed for him on the floor while I learned everything that I needed. And when we got home, I saw that that blanket had a tag on it that was labeled from Project Linus. And I knew immediately what that was because my grandmother, 
the quilter, and one of my aunts had been very involved in Project Linus for several years. And um, if people aren't familiar with Project Linus, it's a nonprofit group that provides quilts, fleece blankets, you know, crocheted afghans, um, any kind of blanket to children under 18 who are in crisis. So it's not only to sick kids in hospitals, but it's you know, to school shootings or fires or domestic violence or anything that's in crisis. So I knew what the group was. And on a really, really difficult day, that gave me the comfort that I needed to know that somebody, somebody out there cared enough, you know, to make a blanket for my kid who they didn't know on a day that we really, really needed it. And so I realized that's something that I could do. I could go back to quilting, you know, whether it was hand quilting or even knitting because I was doing so much of that at the time. Um, But that's a way that I could give back, that I could make a difference to someone, even if I never met them. So I got out my trusty sewing machine and pieced together a quilt top, but I didn't know what I was going to do with it because I didn't have the time to hand quilt it. So I just tied it, which has never been my favorite, but it gets the job done, right? So that's what I did, and I donated it and told my my aunt, who was heavily involved in Project Linus, that I was ready to get started. And she, on a visit back home in Illinois, she hooked me up with several plastic tubs full of fabric and sent me on my way, and I've never looked back. So, so that's really how how I got started, left, and came back to quilting. Excellent. And and I, I love that story, you know, just how you were in it, and it sounds like it almost got... It almost, it it sounds like it almost got stuck because it was so time consuming and the hand quilting and you had, um, I talk about this a lot, a a limited definition of what something is. And that's like, I think it's a surefire way of getting it just killed, you know, of of killing your creativity. Yes. Uh, So when you got back into it, how long before you started machine quilting, before you started saying, okay, I got to get these done. I want to, I want to quilt them (laughs) and I want to use that, that evil form of quilting. (laughs) Right. It, It did not take very long. And it was strictly as a matter of practicality because I knew that I just didn't have to, that if I wanted to hand quilt it, I could only maybe donate one thing a year. And at that point I wanted to do more than that. I had, you know, I had the fabric, I had the resources that I needed to, to create things. I just needed a faster way to do it. So, uh, my aunt told me about the whole, um, quilt as you go idea. So I looked that up online and I did experiment with that a little bit. I just didn't love, the look of it. I like it in concept, but um, but it didn't provide the look that I wanted. So I think I maybe did one quilt that way, um, just something really simple, and then decided, okay, maybe I better look into some basic machine quilting. Because, I, I mean, honestly, I didn't know enough to even know what you needed on a domestic machine, you know, what kind of foot you needed or anything like that. And of course, my machine was really basic, so I didn't have a darning foot or an open toe foot. So that wasn't going to be an option. But one of my friends from my aunt's Project Linus group back home in Illinois had an extra machine, just a domestic machine. It was like a 90s model Viking Lily, and she gave it to me. She had a few, and she needed to clear up space. And so she just gave it to me, which was such a wonderful gift. Um, and it had the foot that I needed and I, I I do get online and see what I could find. So after doing some, some searches of the great Google, I just discovered Leah day. (laughs) And honestly, uh, your videos, were so much clearer to me than the other videos that I could find. And of course, you know, bear in mind at that time, I wasn't even sure what words to use to search for the information that I needed because it's a different world. So, um, so it was really, truly your videos that got me into machine quilting. So I looked back through all of your old stuff. You know, you had videos on the basics of, of getting started with free motion quilting and I worked through all of those, and um, 
I don't know. I, I really don't know how long it was. It wasn't very long that um, I discovered Craftsy, and I found the Block of the Month class that Amy Gibson pieced, and then you taught how to quilt that quilt. And so when I felt confident enough, I decided to do that. So I pieced, worked through the classes to piece the Block of the Month quilt, and then I worked through your videos on how to quilt it. And, I mean, really, by the time you get through that, you're feeling pretty good about things. Absolutely. That is a, that is a pretty massive project. <laughs> Most <It definitely>. was. <laughs> Excellent. And so while you're doing all of this and, and learning and, um, and pushing yourself to, to kind of dig into this whole different world of quilting, and it really is a different world. Uh, you know, yeah. I didn't know the word free motion quilting when I got started quilting at all. Uh, so uh, I know exactly what you're talking about as far as not even knowing what to search for, not even knowing to write the right word to type into Google. Um, so yeah. it sounds like this was just really comforting for you and a really good way to take care of yourself along with your family because... I imagine, you know, and I have no experience with this. I'm very lucky to have a very healthy child. Uh, and and so I have no experience with that. But I can just imagine how traumatic this was, going through this and, and adjusting yeah. to a son with diabetes. It, it really was. I mean, I, and I didn't know anything really about type 1 diabetes or it used to be called juvenile diabetes. Um, and just for your listeners, basically what that means is um, the pancreas stops producing enough insulin. So it has nothing, type one has nothing to do with diet or exercise or any of that. Those things are very beneficial to you, but it is an autoimmune disease. Uh, doctors still aren't exactly sure why it happens, but it just does. So you realize very quickly that the, the insulin that your child needs in order to stay alive has to be very carefully dosed and then if you mess that up, you could potentially kill them or do them very serious harm. So it is extremely intense and extremely stressful, um, not to mention the fact that your child that you love has a disease that can't be cured right now. So it became, and, and at the time, so he was six, my older daughter was eight, and my youngest was about 18 months I homeschool, so we had that, <laughs> and my husband travels a lot for his job, so there was just a lot of stress going on, and I realized very quickly that um, me, as a creative person, was disappearing, and it was, you know, that first year, if your child is diagnosed with diabetes, it's, it's about survival, pure and simple, for everybody. And there's really, you know, no way around that. Yeah, yeah. I'm so sorry that your family went through this, um, but it does sound like things have gotten better. Uh, and has quilting helped with that? It has. Um, you know, I, I liken it to the analogy of the, um, the oxygen mask in an airplane, that they tell you that you need to put yours on first and then help the person with you. And I realized that I needed... I needed to do that in my creative life that, you know, by completely ignoring it, I felt so stifled and you know, it, it's hard to put into words really. Um, but it's just, it was something that I needed to do. I needed to find a creative outlet and, and at the time I, I needed it to be some, some way to help other people, to provide comfort to other people. So it seemed like a really natural entry point for that. Wonderful. And are you still making quilts for Project Linus? How many, how many have you donated so far? Oh gosh. Um, I, I've lost count. I, this past two years, I have not done very much. Uh, I just haven't had time, but I've probably donated or a quilt, you know, either quilted ones that I've pieced or I've also quilted some for my friends back home. Um, at least 50. I don't know. A lot. <laughs> wow, that is a lot. That is a lot. Uh, is there any particular pattern that you like best? Or is there, is there a, like a kind of a simple pattern that you used a lot? Um, not really. I just, you know, I used it. And I, t I try to tell people this, I, I really think that um, 
you know, crafting, whether it's crochet, knitting, quilting, whatever, doing it for charity is a great way to build your skills because, and I don't mean this at all to imply that those quilts are not important because they are, they're very important to the person that receives them, but they don't have to be perfect. You know, I don't believe that any child sitting in a hospital to wrap up in is looking at, at it going, you know, that stitch tension is just a little off here. Could I get another blanket? <laughs> you know, they just don't do that. So um, I don't really have a go-to pattern. I just kind of tried to get online and use some quilting books that I had been given just to work through different ways of piecing different patterns to try out just to build my skills. Excellent. And at what point did you want to start turning this into a business? At what point did your love of machine quilting, your new budding love of machine quilting, <laughs> turn into a desire to, to own a long arm and to start long arming for people? <laughs> it, I don't know that it was really um, a plan exactly. Once I started doing it and, you know, sharing pictures on Facebook and Instagram, I had several people who would ask, hey, I need a baby gift. You know, could I pay you to make something, a, a baby quilt? And, you know, baby quilts are generally smaller, they go faster, and so for those, I was doing everything, I was piecing it, quilting it, finishing it, all of that. So that's really how I kind of worked my way into it. Um, and then at the same time, my Project Linus friends back home, they have, uh, my aunt and her sister have a um, kind of a baby long arm set up. They have a like a six foot frame with a domestic machine on it. And so they can't, they can't physically do anything bigger than twin size. And all they do is stippling, large stippling. And, um, and so they had said, you know, some of our own personal projects, we would love to have you quilt them because we see what you're doing and we really like it. And it would give you a chance to practice. So that's really how it started. And then people in their group started seeing it. And so, so I would get referrals from them. And it's all kind of gone out word of mouth. But my aunt and her sister, who have the baby long arm, they also have a handy quilter 16. This was before the, it became the sweet 16. Um, and so that's the, the handy quilter 16 inch throat machine in a table. And they had had it for a few years, but they were too scared to ever try it. So I didn't even have it set up. It just sat for years and totally ignored. So when I started, because everything I had done to that point was on my domestic machine, they said, you know, maybe you could use this. Maybe maybe you would be brave enough to try it because we're not. So they uh, we brought it down to Nashville and... You know, and it's a, a whole new way of quilting. It, it almost feels like you have to start over. Um, even though I was working on a domestic, you know, just suddenly having a totally flat surface and more space, um, you know, it just felt different to me. So I worked on the 16 for a while and continued to work through some of your videos. I did your one of your other crafty classes classes and worked through learning fillers and all of that. And, um, and also got at that point was getting into Instagram and seeing other quilters, finding out who other, uh, machine quilters were, you know, because I like seeing different styles and different ways of doing things. So I worked through, um, a few videos that Angela Walters had done, which kind of branched me out a little bit more. And started to think, you know, I really love, but I feel limited with a sit-down machine. I feel like, you know, I, I don't have the space in my house to set up other tables along with it to give me a place for the quilt to rest. So it just, it gets hard. I mean, you know this. It gets physically demanding to wrestle a large quilt when you're quilting at a sit-down machine, whether that's a, you know, a table mounted or... A domestic. So I started to look at the options for uh, an actual long arm on a frame. 
and I think it was in 2000, late 2014, um, I was able to get one, and I got a Handy Quilter Avante, which is an 18-inch throat um, with a 12-foot frame, and so that's that's what I'm using. Excellent, and I, I think it's so interesting what you said about your, your aunt having this table matted long arm and not even playing on it for years. Like, I've just started no. a series, I've just started a series exactly for people like that. It's Set Down Quilting Sundays, just teaching quilting on a set down long arm yeah. because they can be intimidating. They really, you know, even though it's still quilting and moving the quilt under the needle, and even though it's very similar in feel, it's still a long arm. That's a different type of machine, right. you know? So I think that's yeah. that's so funny that uh, you were kind of bequeathed these machines over and over again <laughs> from different right. people. That's so lucky. And, and you know, know, and I think that it really is serendipitous. Maybe everything kind of came together at the right time for you. I think so. Yeah, I really do. Excellent. So tell me about your services. You know, you do long arming and it sounds like you mostly uh, uh, kind of advertise through word of mouth. Uh, so what services do you offer for other people? Um, well, let me tell you what I don't do. I don't do binding. I hate binding. I just do. And I feel, I feel like a fraud because so many of my friends online who are quilters are like, oh, binding, it's finally my favorite part. I can just sit and watch TV and, and hand stitch my binding. <laughs> And I'm just like, I would, I would like to pay someone to do that for me. Um, that's just not my thing. I do it because I have to for myself, but I don't offer that as a service for other people. Um, but what I do offer is whatever kind of machine quilting that you think you might like. Um, of course, I do you know, what's called edge-to-edge, a repeating design like stippling or loops or whatever that is, you know, that's kind of the, the most basic option, um, all the way up through intensive, um, custom quilting. So, um, th- I mean, that's really it. It's all, I, I, I'm open to doing whatever somebody might want me to try to do. Cool. And do you, do you find that's a struggle Like you get quilts where people are like, I have no idea, just do whatever you want? Or do you get a lot more? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, <laughs> so you see that a lot. <laughs> what can we do oh, about yeah. that? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's funny because I, I find even with my own projects and I, I'm always curious to hear, I, I would be curious to hear what you have to say about this. I really think that without sounding too weird, the quilt tells you what it wants. Um, you know, and sometimes I have to stare at it for a long time to be able to, to figure that out. And I think even for me, even in the process of quilting, there are times that I just know, okay, that's enough. Or, mm, I thought this was going to be enough, but it really needs a little bit more. Um, you know, and sometimes people will tell me, you know, I don't care what you do. Let's just do some kind of all over pattern. Let's, let's keep it more affordable. Um, and that's fine. You know, I'll do whatever people want, but it, it, I, I both like it and struggle with it when people will give me completely free reign because it means I have to put a lot more thought into it, which I enjoy, but I know it's going to take longer. Absolutely. And, um, tell me about how you price your services. I know this can be a bit of a struggle just from reading different, uh, you know, different long armors talking about how they price their services. So, so what are your feelings about that and how do you do it? You know, it really was hard. And I, I got online because I wanted to see where, where those prices fell locally within my local area, which is kind of, ended up kind of funny because I've done hardly any quilting for anyone local. Um, but to be honest, I could hardly find anybody online in, in the Nashville area. And I know they're out there. I know that there are long arm quilters here, but they just, they don't have web websites or at least not that I could find. So and the ones that I could find, um, offered mostly, you know, they were Statler, Stitcher, Statler Stitchers, um, Gamel, really just offering edge-to-edge um, quilting designs or pantograph designs. So 
I try to, to look at those prices and gauge, okay, for my, for what I consider edge to edge designs, you know, a simple repeating pattern over the whole quilt, nothing custom, I would feel comfortable in this price range. Um, and then working up from there. But it, I think it's really hard to know because you don't want to price yourself out of your market. And yet I've heard um, Karen McTavish talk about this, that if you, if you price yourself at the lowest end, you actually can hurt your local market because people may send you more work than you can do because you're the cheapest one. But then how do you get those clients then to grow with you? You know, how do you ever raise your prices because you're known as the cheap quilter? So it's, it's really tricky, I think. Yeah. And I think so much of that comes from having value in your work and it's, it's hard to do when you're at the beginning, you know, and and kind of going, I just need experience. But, um, and I've heard this said multiple times, you can start high and then go low, but starting low and going high, growing pains (laughs) that can hurt. (laughs) Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think some of the best advice that I, I heard Um, I think it was Angela Walters that said, hey, you know, set your price and then it's totally your prerogative if you want to give a discount. And so I do that a lot, you know, especially when it's for friends or for family Um, or if I'm trying something, maybe some new design or something that I'm kind of learning on the fly. You know, I don't hesitate to to give people a discount, Um, but you're right. I mean, at first, especially, you know, we have the mindset of, well, I'm not worth X amount because I'm still learning, but I don't know. I don't know how you, how you have the confidence, I guess, to work past that and say, okay, I am still learning and I'm going to gain experience as I go, but I am worth this regardless. Yeah. And I I think that's really important to kind of figure out how to get yourself there. Uh, pricing. I, I have, I've never charged for services. Like I've never, I've never done long arming or quilting for anything like that, but I did so professionally for a while. This was way before mm-hmm. the quilting business. And that experience taught me that uh, setting your price too low can be damaging, not just to your business. It can be damaging to your health and to your family. Yes. Uh, you know, I was, I was chugging out 60 garments a week for maybe like $6 a garment. I mean, it was ridiculous. Wow. Uh, and, and it taught me a, a very hard lesson about um, working too cheaply. And that's why I have been, I have yeah. been completely resistant to ever quilting for, for hire because of that. And uh, I just find it fascinating yeah. and just learning more about it. And, and I, and I realized just reading as much as I have, everyone I think struggles with this. I don't think anyone has a, a you know, a, a golden bullet when it comes to it or a golden rule. I think everyone struggles with it and it's going to always be tough. Uh, so tell me about balancing your long arm business, which sounds pretty busy, with your family life because you've got three kids, and I know how busy, and you homeschool, and I mean I know how crazy that can be. So tell me how you balance it all, and and how you how you have space for everything. <laughs> well, you know, you know, people ask me that a lot. You know, how do you how do you do it? Well, you just do. I mean, you. I don't have a grand plan. I don't have any secrets. I just girl panties and do it I mean um, things that I learned and it's harder now because my long arm is in the basement so it's removed from everybody else so I really need to try to limit my time on that either to after bedtime or afternoons once we've got school done and the kids are kind of settled and you know doing whatever you know they're old enough now that I can be before they Heck, before they keep them gone some days. Um, but it's hard. And at first, um, originally I had my sewing machine, my domestic machine set up in my bedroom, which I didn't love, but we have a small house and you do what you have to do. But I, I learned that you can get a lot more done than you think you can in 20 minutes. You know, if you go and just say, okay, I've got 20 minutes until I need to start fixing dinner, you know, you can whip out a quilt block or whatever, you know, whatever it might be, you may not, you're not going to do a whole big project, but you can make progress 
chunks in little chunks. So that's, that's probably the biggest tip that I have for people that have limited time. To just work in those little 20, 15, 20 minute segments every day, like all those little stolen moments, you use those up. Yeah. Yeah. I think so. I mean, you know, when you have the time, time to make the time or schedule the time to sit down for an hour or two you do that um but you you kind of have to learn to make peace with the 20 minutes here and 20 minutes there for a while until you can can learn to manage it better and i mean really this, this past year it became a lot more important because i was building um non-stop for Luke Kane, and I, I simply had to, I had to make the, I never literally scheduled it the way some people might, um, but there were days that I thought, eh, maybe I better do that, because it, it does get hard to manage it, and it's, I mean, of my kids, I would do anything for my kids, but there are some days that, you know, with their behavior, the way it, it can be, the way any kids can be, there are days that I'm like, you know, I would, I would really rather go quilt than deal with this, this nonsense right now, but you can't do that. So. Yeah, I, I completely relate to that. Uh, and, you know, there's also that struggle between the need to create something for yourself and the need to create what you're being obviously paid to, to create. So how do you balance that? Do you keep your own projects going uh, or, right. you know, how do you, how do you manage that? That's really been one of the biggest challenges for me is, is finding that balance between working on my own projects, my personal projects, and the things that I'm being paid to do for other people. And this past year, really, my own personal projects have just have needed to be set aside uh, because I had other commitments that just were on a deadline and had to get done. Um, but just recently, uh, my time has kind of freed up from some of the big projects, and and I realized that I am going to have to put my own projects kind of in the queue with with my customer things. Otherwise, they're not going to get done because I'll always give my customer quilts higher preference over my own. Um, and I, again, it's just I think it's it's hard for us, hard for women, probably for people in general to put ourselves as a priority and. I mean, yes, it's a quilt. Is it, you know, is it a huge priority in my life? It is, but it's not critical. But it's, again, it comes back to that creative outlet. And that if I don't have that, I suffer. You know, I suffer, my attitude suffers. Um, the way I interact with my family suffers. So I've just had to, to tell myself, okay, when I finish this, client's quilt, then I'm going to work on my own until that's done. And then I'll go back. So, and, you know, and of course, on a practical level, if somebody gets in touch and says, Hey, I have a quilt, could you do it? I need it by this date. I will give that priority over my own stuff. So. Yeah. Yeah. That's, it's a tough one for me too. I'll be completely honest. I mean, uh, I make, you know, obviously the goddess quilts are you know, my favorite series, but, um, if I've got something that I need to create to, you know, as a pattern for the site or like the quilt along that I run, that absolutely takes precedence because it makes income, you know, and it, right. it's, it's tough. It's tough to say, oh, no, I don't need that money. Let me go work on this emotional, personal <laughs> thing. <laughs> you right. know? Exactly. Uh, but, it, you know, I think you're right. Like trying to find that space within ourselves to go, no, this has equal value. Like it might not make me dollars and cents, but it will make me peace of mind and happiness and uh, it will make me a better person, you know. So I, I it, it does. And, I, you know, and I found... And again, this is this is personal for me. Um, I think especially because I devoted the first two years to exclusively quilting for other people, and with with the rise of social media, um, you know, it's a blessing and a curse. I love it and I hate it. Um, I love it because it gives me the ability to see and be inspired by so many people that I wouldn't see otherwise. You know, so many other quilters and artists and all different things that I wouldn't be exposed to otherwise. And at the same time, then there's the trap of comparison. 
And, you know, so many of my, the people that I've gotten to know on social media have, I don't want to say risen to fame. It's not quite that dramatic, but, you know, have become well known, let's say in their, in their respective circles. And if I'm honest, I find that I do struggle with comparison and saying, okay, well then where does that leave me? Because I want you know, we all want to be considered an equal. Um, and that's just, uh, I don't know. It, it's, I think it gets complicated. Um, there are times that I need, find I need to just step back and, and remind myself, okay, it's not about that. It's not about comparing or being an equal. You know, I don't, I don't even want some of the things that some of these people are doing. Um, but uh, I'll, I will say that I, I have struggled some with the idea of I'm just a long armor. Um, and, I, and I don't know if, if many people will relate to what I mean by that. It's kind of like how a lot of times as moms, we say, oh, well, I'm just a mom, as though it's not important or it's a lesser task. And, and and I'm not trying to compare long arming or quilting to being a mother. I don't mean that. It's just, you know, I think sometimes because the quilting side of making a quilt um, can be considered kind of the last part, or it's a finishing part, let's say. Um, so sometimes it's like there's, it feels like there's maybe not as much. Um, credit maybe I'm not even sure if that's the right word um but I've, I've definitely gotten the vibe from some people sometimes of well you know what you do is really cool you made that quote look good but you're just a long armor as though that's not a valid thing wow you know it's it's so funny I I love hearing other people's perspectives because this is a totally new perspective to me uh, I've never heard that before, and I've never kind of gotten that vibe from anyone before. Um, but well, I can that's because I, you're Leah Day. <laughs> <laughs> well, but I I can see what you're saying. Like, oh, but you just quilted it. You didn't piece it. You didn't make that top. You didn't pick those colors. You just selected right. the thread and the designs. And to me, I see that as yes, you just added a third dimension of design. You just added texture. You just added. You made the quilt stable. You stopped it from you. You made it wear. Right. 50 million times better. I mean, like, I see that as all the positives because that's where, that's the world I'm coming from, you know? And so this is, it, it's totally fascinating to me to hear you say that. And um, the, the best thing I can say about, you know, that comparison, and ch let me tell you, I struggle with this. I get stuck in that whole thing too. And I have to sometimes turn off my phone and just say, you know what, I'm going to go quilt and I don't care who, what so-and-so is doing and how many books so-and-so has written and you know what, what they're yeah. all doing in their own world and how I always kind of come back to myself and kind of shut all that stuff down with is the reminder that we are all running our own race. So, right. so there's, there might be like a 50 meter dash and that 50 meter dash is for, you know, for the, the person that wants to run a business, like, you know, like X, Y, Z, like, you know, she wants to travel right. and teach and she wants to do all that stuff. And then there's another race and it's a marathon, you know, and, uh, yeah. and what I want to do is totally different. I just want, I want to run a business that is consistently producing for the rest of my life, you know, and I don't want to burn out and it's trying to figure out that balance. But the thing that always helps me is to remind myself, like, we are all at a track meet, but we're all running different races and we're not competing against one another. Like we're all on right. the same team. Ultimately, we're all quilters on the same team. And I don't know why, but that always helps. It always makes me feel like, there's space for all of us to all do our own thing, you know? Yeah. Yeah. But I agree. I mean, I've seen, um, you know, some of the motivational memes, there's one that says something to the effect of, you know, you can't compare your B roll with somebody else's highlight reel. And uh, that's exactly what it is. You know, what we see on Instagram and Facebook and Twitter, those are the highlights, you know, of course we all want to put our best foot forward and, you know, but it, we don't see the, the hard slog that it takes 
so many of us to get to that point to where we have a highlight to share. Exactly. I mean, like, you know, you don't see the, the days and days and days of slugging through a book in order to write it. We see the nice shiny book at the end. And it seems right. like magical. Like, how did you do that in two months, you know, or whatever? Right. When really it took years. It took years and years and years right. to create that. So I completely agree with you. I do find it so fascinating uh, just just that perspective that you had about being a long armor. I've struggled with that myself. I felt uh, in, a, in some ways illegitimate as a teacher because I teach online and because I teach in my basement and and that, you know, maybe I was not as good as everyone else because I'm just this girl that's shooting videos in her in her basement. So I think <laughs> everyone has these issues and I think they all come out yeah. in different ways. And I, I, you know, I find that really interesting because two coming from a whole machine perspective, you know, so many whole machine quilters are like, oh, you know, it's such a big deal to get a long arm. And it's even a bigger right. deal to run a business with a long arm. So, I mean, I'm kind of in the opposite camp. I'm like, oh, my gosh, you're cool. you're so cool. You're a long arm quilter. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's just different perspectives. And always, I guess, I guess anytime that you start to feel that, always kind of tap back into there is someone out there who would so be like excited and psyched up to have my job, you know, and like yeah, to be and, that long arm yeah. quilter. That, that really is true. I mean, it, it totally is. And, you know, and I have to stop and remind myself and think, okay, now think back a year and a half ago, could you ever, could I have ever imagined that I would be quilting for the people that I quilt for? No, of course not. Yeah. So. Yeah, it's yeah, amazing it, how It is all changed. about perspective. Yeah. And uh, real quickly, you mentioned that you have quilted a lot for Luke Hayes. Do you want to talk about that real quick? Sure. Um, so I, I quilted, um. I think the total came in at 34 of Luke's uh, log cabin quilts. So Luke Haynes, if people don't know, he's an artist slash quilter um, based in L.A. at the moment. And uh, last year he decided to do a show of 50 log cabin quilts. Um, They are all made from repurposed materials, so they are all made from uh, clothing and fabrics that he got from Goodwill in LA. Um, so they have anything and everything under the sun in them fabric wise. Um, the quilts are all black and white with red squares, um, as tradition dictates for log cabins. And, um, they're all approximately 90 inches square. So they're about queen size. And, um, you know, I knew who Luke was from Instagram Um, and I loved his work. I really just, my, that I gravitated to, um, his style for my own personal taste. And I had seen him post, I don't know, maybe two or three pictures of some of the first log cabins that were pieced. And I noticed on one, um, he, he said, now, does anybody want to help quilt these? And, And I've told him this, I truly thought that he was joking, but there was that one little nagging voice in the back of my head that said, well, what if he's not joking? What if he really does need somebody to quilt them? So I left a comment on that Instagram post and said, you know, I don't know if you're really serious, but I would love to quilt one. You know, here's how you can get in touch. And, you know, never thought that I would hear anything more from it. And, um, and at the same time, that was, I had only had my long arm for about six months. But I had been, you know, I had been using the the table mounted machine for the previous year before that, so it wasn't like I had no experience. And in just a day or two, I got a message from Luke saying, "I would really, I really do need help. And um, how can I send you one? You know, what would you charge? And all of those kind of details." And so the agreement was that he would send one for me to do, and then we would go from there as to whether I would want to do any more or if he would be satisfied or whatever. So, um, for, for these log cabin projects, everything, well, I can't say everything. Uh, most of the, of the quilting that Luke does is saying thought he likes just back and forth lines uh, about the spaced about a quarter inch apart. Um, and, and it's not a hard edge. So if you hit a seam, you know, you don't, hit the seam, stitch in the ditch, 
town and then go, you know, go down a quarter inch. He likes kind of a rounded edge. So you just kind of hit the seam and, and bounce back and keep going. But he was very specific that he did, he, he likes a by hand sort of flex that he did not want work or anything like that. He wanted it to just kind of be freehanded. So he sent the first quilt and I was able, I didn't have anything else going on. So I was able to turn it around really quickly and um, he was happy with it. And he did send a sample, like a 12 inch block log cabin sample um, so that I could see exactly the look that he was going for with the quilting. And, and um, I did the first one and sent it back and he's like, okay, great. Great. Can you, the initial arrangement I think was that I would do 10 quilts and then it just kind of kept going. And, um, so yeah, I, no, there were 50 quilts for the show. I, I did 34. I think two of those were extras that were not in the actual show. Um, and then since then I've done like another six or seven. So I think the next one that I do will be the 40th quilt for him. Wow, that is such a, a huge and amazing project. I mean, I and it's so funny how things can happen like that, where like just this little comment on Instagram can lead to obviously something huge and very successful oh, yeah. between the two of you. So that's wonderful. It's it's been it's been so fun, and I've learned so much um, about quilting in general. Yeah, I've learned uh, so much about quilting I've learned a lot about my machine um really one of the the biggest uh, most fun to me things that I've learned is just ex seeing how it works quilting on non-traditional quilting fabrics um you know when you see them up close you're it, it's kind of mind-boggling to see how all of those scraps can work together to create this bigger picture that's so cool and so visually striking but you know and I, I do have to say and Luke knows how I feel about this quilting through towels and quilting through fake fur it's not a good time oh my it's gosh like, <laughs> it's like trying to quilt through shag carpet it's really not fun especially if you have a problem and you need to go and rip those stitches out because you can't see them <laughs> I cannot even imagine. Oh my gosh, that totally changes my perspective on the whole thing. <laughs> that sounds like a complete beast to do, but you stuck with it. I think that's amazing. So uh, wrapping up here, and I, I know we could easily talk for like another hour. I will definitely have you back on the podcast for us sure. to share more. Uh, but uh, why don't you just share this, the last question I always ask, and what are you most excited about? What are you, where are you wanting to go and grow in the next five years? Um, that's a great question. Um, one thing that I would love to do, in, quilting wise, I would love to do a collaboration with somebody. Um, you know, people, I think, think sometimes, oh well, you quilt for the pains. You know, that's a big deal. Well, it is a big deal, and I love doing it, but in this situation, I'm a hired hand, you know, I'm, I'm considered like a studio helper. Um, you know, I'm not collaborating. I'm not offering any input. I'm, I don't have creative leeway, you know, to, to do my, thing. everything I do for him to this point anyway, has been lines, just back forth, queen sized lines, lines and lines and lines, um, which I love. And, you know, and I don't want to trade that. But I would love to to work with somebody else, um, you know, to do something that's a little more creative, um, a little more. I don't know. I, I don't know that artistic is the right word necessarily, but I don't know. I'm just I'm I'm open to whatever may come my way, um, and otherwise, I don't know. I think there's so much. I, I think you could relate to this. Even though you, you quilt and you build your skills and you learn new things, there's still so much to learn. I mean, I want to learn more about my machine. I want to be able to troubleshoot the few times that I do have an issue. I want to know more about how that works. Um, 
I need to get really a lot better at ruler work. I love the look of it, but man, I hate doing it. It's hard and it's tedious and it takes forever, (laughs) but it's something that I want to get better at. Excellent. I completely agree with you. Quilting, the reason I'm a quilter is because this is such a vast and amazing hobby and I think I can dig into this and stick with it and try something new and I'll still have more stuff to learn when I'm an old lady. (laughs) So that's why I, that's why I'm a quilter. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show. Julie, can you tell everybody where they can find you online? Sure. Well, thank you for having me. Um, Really the best place to find me online for quilting is on Instagram. My Instagram username is personable. That's P E R S I N A B L E. Uh, that's probably the best way to find me. Um, and from there, you can direct message me um, and we could communicate by email or whatever. I am on Facebook under my actual name, but I try to keep it more for personal stuff most of the time. Excellent. Well, thank you again for being on the show. Uh, that's it for this episode. If you'd like to learn more and find links to everything that Julie and I have mentioned in this episode, you can find it at freemotionproject.com. Until next time, let's go quilt.